I look back on myself and, and even when I tell people, oh yeah, no, so I just got diagnosed with ADHD. Most people are like, oh yeah, we've known that forever, but you know, it never seemed like a thing because I was good enough at school and I was smart enough that I could get by on all the stupid things that I did. I could get my homework done on the bus every morning, which is indeed what happened most of the time. I could lose entire textbooks for months and still do well in classes. And I got better as I got older. So that helped and I figured out systems, but I was definitely like, I underachieved at a really kind of funky level. Like I probably should have been top of my class and I was like seventh in my class. ADHD Rewired episode 332. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Melissa Bartlett. Melissa, better known to her students as Dr. B, is an associate professor in life sciences at Mohawk Valley Community College in Utica, there I said it. Mm-hmm. In Utica, New York. It's it's always good when I pre-read the bios. I did read it once. Um she has a she has a PhD in aquatic microbial ecology from Kent State University, where she studied, and as she explains to her mother, stream scum, (laughs) and to me, because that would make more sense as well, Uh, she has been teaching biology for the last nine years, mostly to students who think they are not good at science. She also runs a local science program for children and loves to talk about microbiology any chance she gets. In her spare time, Dr. B is a science fiction lover, a runner, and a player of complex board games. She also likes to sing and is willing to rock out at karaoke any chance she gets. So before we dive in, I just want you to know that we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did an open mic slash karaoke here on Zoom. Um, so if I schedule another one out, I hope to see you there. Oh, yeah. I actually almost made it to that last one, but you're on uh, the wrong time frame for me. And it was like 10 o'clock at night. And I was just dead. Totally aware. It was it was a little bit of a later, later evening. So, uh, well, first of all, Melissa, welcome to the podcast. And if I recall, um, you actually had set a, a world record in ADHD Rewired for our pre-interview as the most focused and shortest pre-interview. I, I think we were six minutes and we're like... I think that we've covered everything. Okay, we'll see you soon. And it was amazing. So I'm hoping that this conversation is going to be as focused and uh, with, without uh, without some of the fluff as uh, we can get for you. So, so let's start with um, a little bit of, of your story, because I know that what you want to talk about today with, with our listeners is kind of helping students come back to college, adjusting to, to change, dealing with online learning. Um, you know, for, so there's a lot of changes obviously that are going on with, with COVID. Um, but let's first begin with you. So you were diagnosed with ADHD. How long ago? January. January. So <laughs> the ink is still drying. Pretty much. It pretty much is not that long ago at all. And, and you said to me, uh, I think before we hit record and something that is no, not that uncommon, uh, something about like your intelligence basically made you go under the radar. Oh, absolutely. Because I look back on myself and, and even when I tell people, oh, yeah, no. So I just got diagnosed with ADHD. Most people are like, oh, yeah, we've known that forever. But, you know, it never seemed like a thing because I was good enough at school and I was smart enough that 
I could get by on all the stupid things that I did. I could get my homework done on the bus every morning, which is indeed what happened most of the time. I could lose entire textbooks for months and still do well in classes. And I got better as I got older. So that helped and I figured out systems, but I was definitely like, I underachieved at a really kind of funky level. Like I probably should have been top of my class and I was like seventh in my class. <laughs> but answer the question of what do you mean by funky level? Okay. Um, so what was it that drove you to or towards uh, um, learning that you had ADHD? Interestingly enough, it was an honor student presentation at my college. So one of our honor students gave a presentation about ADHD, which was because her brother had ADHD. And I had heard about it before and I'd known some people who were, but I'd always kind of dismissed it as that can't possibly be me for all of the reasons. And she listed all these things and I'm like, oh no, no, those definitely are me. And that was a number of years ago. And then within the last year and a half, my sort of work duties changed a little bit. I started doing more administrative work. I'm moving in a different direction. Suddenly I needed a lot more executive function and then it all started failing. Mm. And so that's when I was like, okay, I need to learn more about this to find out why I can't accomplish these goals. I fell down, you know, a rabbit hole. I love to, I'm a scientist, so I like to learn. I like to read. I read Driven to Distraction. I found your podcast. I backtracked through a ton of information and then mostly walked into my doctor's office and said, this is me. And what did your doctor say? Well, he made me go through all the criteria properly, but then was very clear that he also agreed that this was me and that I might be the most classic case of adult ADHD he had encountered. So you, you were working this job you love and then the, the um, addition of more administrative duties come on board, which is it's sort of like the that that synergistic impact of life meets like our threshold is sort of it, it almost the canary in the coal mine where it's like if you weren't sure there was a problem to begin with as add, add some additional administrative tasks to somebody with ADHD and you're going to see those things uh, kind of arise. So it sounds like that's kind of what was what your story was. Oh yeah, definitely. Being being an eccentric professor actually gets you out of a lot of ADHD holes for a long time because you're given a lot of freedom. I pretty much rearranged my entire class to work around what I could manage. How so? But I can't do that with other things. Uh, I don't grade very effectively. As you would imagine, trying to accomplish a stack of grading is really hard for somebody with ADHD. I don't know how my colleagues actually do it. So I shifted the way I do my class so that a lot of it was based on in-class work. And if I saw you, you were there and you did it. And then the rest of the grading was based on things that Blackboard could do on its own without me having to be involved. So I now hand grade very few things. So there are... At least three people that have been through my coaching programs that I'm specifically thinking of who have who really wrestled with um, grading. And I just want if you are listening, you know who you are. Listen to what Melissa is saying. You don't have to grade in the regular way. Yeah. And in fact, the more I learn about how I, I think education should be working, the more I think we spend too much of our time doing nitty gritty grading when we could be having conversations about critical thinking and giving students ways to learn on their own. So mm -hmm. it also works with my educational philosophy. I mean, I think about it as someone who loves engaging in intellectual debate, right? like as someone with ADHD, what a great way to, to, to grade someone, like invite your students one at a time and you debate a topic with them. Like, have it, you know, it's that stimulates the brain. It sees what they're, what, how much they really understand a, um, a certain topic. And for all those students who can just memorize stuff, it's going to scare the crap out of them. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I asked them, they love to, they're allowed to use their phones in my class because I'm an open device class. And a lot of times I'll ask a question, they'll get me the answer right off Google. And I'll say, that's great. Explain that to me. <laughs> freeze i'm like you, you see you're gonna need to try better so what are you seeing um right now as we are in going into the third month of uh of COVID 19 um as some of the challenges and how has that kind of played out uh, where, where you're at um 
for for students who are you know now in a educational scenario that was probably not what they signed up for, but it is what they are in now. Oh yeah, no, definitely. This was not what most people signed up for. So part of the problem with switching to online learning is that when you used to have a schedule and you had to show up to it, people are pretty good at like, okay, I got to be here. People are expecting me. I got to do something. When everything's online, you're making your own schedules and you're trying to figure out what's happening. We also have to shift the way things are done because you can't have a class conversation as easily online, which means that you're going to be getting assignments that are different. The other problem with finishing this semester, and now fortunately most colleges have at least finished or are right at the tail end of this past semester, is that we were essentially putting the pieces together. We were making do with what we had and we were faking it real good. But this fall, we're going to be expected to do a lot better. So it was interesting. It just kind of occurred to me that while a lot of things in my life I have, uh, I've uh, been kind of laying down the tracks as the train is coming. Like the rest of the world has been kind of, I think, like ha- has had an experiential opportunity to understand what it's like to have ADHD, where like all of a sudden, like things change and now you're having to figure stuff out as you go and you're kind of just making it up as you go. Um, so it is just kind of an interesting sort of thought experiment just to, for people to recognize that like, so you know how you have to do that and make those changes for yourself uh, this semester? Welcome to my life. Yeah, interestingly enough, I've adapted really well to this, probably better than I should. And that's actually really interesting because I've had a lot of conversations with, with folks around it. And I said, you know what? Like, they've, they're actually doing great because of this. Like, it has just re- forced them to, to respond to this situation in a way that is really working for their brain. So that's also really uh, kind of really interesting um, dynamic that has played out as a result of this. Yeah, but I can see it in, and and I could from the students that I was communicating with, that a lot of them were not ready for for the differences and for what you have to do to make it work. Well, how did you adapt? For me, I had already pushed a lot of things online. I'm already very tech oriented. So doing that with my class wasn't too hard. I'm good at staying in communication, which I think was me better than a lot of my other, some of my fellow colleagues maybe weren't as quick at getting online and as quick at emailing back their students and things like that. So I have kind of a a one-up advantage on being able to do that. And then I understand the tech already. So that helps a lot. I was helping a lot of people with like, oh my God, how do we suddenly make this thing online? I'm like, oh, I can make you a video for that. It's real easy. I do it all the time. Hmm. So what would you suggest? Because I know that we have... For some reason, it seems like there's actually a lot of college professors in our listening audience. Um, What would you suggest to professors who are, you know, kind of maybe still struggling with figuring uh, a whole new way of teaching out? My suggestion for professors has tended to be, and especially this is I've learned this over the time, is that I kind of try to gear my class less like I actually was taught and more like I think I should learn. So I've made a lot of changes that sort of fall into the, well, why have we been doing lecture stuff for so long? We actually know it doesn't work that well. It never really worked well for me back in the day. And in fact, I slept through a lot of lectures. And so trying to find sort of different ways to do things can be helpful. It takes a little bit more. One of the problems is, is that there's a little bit more upfront on some of that. You have to start with something new, but there's also a lot of people out there who've done it before and college professors are real chill. Most of the time, there's a small percentage that are not about just giving away stuff. Like, Hey, if I've done something here, do you want my version of it? And can you adapt it to something? And so using the space that's out there, there's been a Facebook group. It's got like 40,000 college professors in it who've been working on this ever since we all got pushed online to help each other out. And then I think another key is really dealing with what do we want the students to really learn? I'm teaching non-science students science. They are in no way, shape, or form going to remember every detail of every electrolyte that helps a neuron function two weeks after being done with my class. But I want them to learn the skills of being able to critically think their way through it, find a way to learn the information, to ask questions about it, and to apply it to a new situation. So even if they don't remember it later, they'll go back and go, oh, I figured that out. I could do that again. Most of the thing, one of the things I just heard you say is you have a very clear why 
to what you're doing. And by, by doing that, it allows you to sort of think about the whole problem very differently. Right. Cause I think sometimes we get so close to what the problem is that we don't kind of pull back enough to be able to see, all right, what, what is the actual goal here? The goal is to, I want my students to be able to be critical thinkers, right? Not that they can understand microbial ecology. It's like glance down to my notes, like, what is that word? Um, so it's more about the critical thinking. Oh yeah, definitely. So nailing our learning objectives to to those life skills, to the learning skills that we know we want them to have instead of to the detail skills of whether they can, you know, learn these words or make this math problem work, I, I think really gauges us in the right direction. And I know that where we are at right now, uh, we are recording this uh, just in the beginning of June. Um, you know, come this fall, there's still a lot of unknowns. I know there are colleges that are saying, yes, we're going to be in session. We're going to be, um, some of it will be online. Some of it, so there's still a lot of stuff that's still being figured out um, right now. And so whether um, a student has already been enrolled in school and has been doing this and now they're having to shift to something that is different than what they are used to, or they are maybe entering, you know, higher ed for the very first time. Um, there's a lot of stuff that that is going to um, need to be sort of accommodated for, right? So what I want to do is um, take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to talk to you and find out from you what do you, where do you see sort of education, uh, college education, uh, kind of going, and how can students most adequately prepare uh, for those those upcoming changes? All right, we will be right back. I should have told you this is Barb from ADHD Rewired. I'm Eric's assistant and I happen to be a poet. He is taking a week off from the coaching ads. So as I sneak in a little poetry, don't tell him. He can find out when the podcast drops. Attention deficit birthmark. My neck twists as I watch them bunch through the town. Tentative fire throwers of crisp ancestry. Will you follow that light dance and blaze through some meaning inside a mess of words? I always start and never have a path or destination in mind. I always start and belong to a place that evaporates and warps through the dense folds of your smirky tendencies. I start and then I begin again. I can't articulate a thought that makes sense enough to go deep enough to say I went to school. I graduated with some degree of separation from the sensibilities that everyone else in the world has. Everyone. I don't hold anyone's attention. No one. And I start again. ADHD Rewired has many voices. Mine is one of them. What brings you to ADHD Rewired? Are you a carpenter, an office worker? Have you lost your job? Are you creative? Are you an artist? Whatever you do, whoever you are, you are here right now. We are in our own little world here. We are all wired the same, but come from different paths in our lives. And we meet here to grow and lead more mindful, complete, happy lives. We can be all over the place, but the one place you have to lead yourself if you want to grow alongside other members of this community is to coaching rewired.com. This is where you can find out more about our coaching and accountability groups. Once you're there, you click on the black button so you get on our fall interest list. And those boring words, fall interest list, mean that you will get invited to our next registration event and it's by invitation only. You need to get on the list. So whether you're brand new to the podcast and you're learning about these groups for the first time, or you've been thinking about joining these groups for months or even years, come on over to coachingrewired.com to learn more and add your name to our registration invitation list. 
Our fall registration kickoff event is September 3rd. It will only take a minute. For those of you that have received an error message after confirming that you want to be on our interest list for this fall's coaching sessions, that has been resolved by our email platform provider. Please send a message to support at ADHDrewired.com if you want to confirm that you were on that fall coaching and accountability list for the fall. And thank you so much for your interest. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back. And uh, as I was glancing down here at my notes, I realized that I think I actually mispronounced your last name and when I introduced you. Because um, I even ask in my, like, when he fill out the, the, the stuff for schedule, it's like, please write it phonetically. Which is great because it's right here on my note. I just didn't actually look at that part because I pronounced it as a uh, Bartlett and uh, it is um, you wrote very nicely with an asterisk. Barlet denotes emphasis. So is it Barlet? Bar- Barlet? It's still Barlet. Barlet. There's just no T in the middle and I'm not a pair. And you're not... <laughs> 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 Apparently. Okay. Uh bad puns aside. Let's um uh let's dive into what so what's what's college gonna look like now? It is hard to say, and it's gonna be very school dependent. So I'm part of the New York State system of community colleges. We don't get to make any of our own decisions. All of our decisions come from other people. Um And it seems very likely because we're being very careful. New York has had a lot of issues. So New York is doing its best to be, to keep things spread out and to move slowly. And so I anticipate most of our lectures are going to be online in the fall, no matter what, just as a safety measure. And also that way, things that need to be in person, they have more classroom space for, and they can keep people spaced out. So even though we don't have an official decision yet. We have a three and a half possibilities plan. I am planning that I'm probably going to be mostly online in the fall because if I plan that way, it's easier to back off, but I want to be ahead of it. Okay. So you you actually might be well uh, equipped to answer this, this question. Um, So something that I have been personally kind of wrestling with is, you know, we've been on sort of quarantine and social distancing and um, now we're starting to look at sort of reintegrating back into life. And I'm like, well, that's where what the states, a lot of the states are, are moving in that direction. But is the data moving in that direction to support that decision? And how can actually students um, keep themselves safe? There's definitely like a whole lot of levels of risk. And so this is where my background in microbiology is also useful. I've also been everybody's fact checker for the last three months, which has been a lot of fun. Um, But one of the concerns with this particular virus is that it transmits easily in small enclosed spaces where people are close to each other, which is unfortunately classrooms. And especially college classrooms are very often tight spaces. Like we put 40 people in a room that holds about 50 people. So it's like everybody's pretty near each other. And we know that that's going to be difficult. Even with masks on, if the air is not really circulating, it may or may not be a super safe space depending on how things are going. So there's going to be a lot of wanting to do more cleaning. And then there's the high touch surfaces problem, which is that things like door handles and desks are high touch surfaces that people are on all the time. And so those would be things that you'd want to be cleaned. So the reality is, is if you didn't touch anything and you wore a mask and we keep the air circulating in and out, not just internally, that it probably wouldn't be that bad. On the other hand, I'm not entirely sure I really want a learning experience where all of my students are three feet apart from each other and not talking to me. Mm. So we're also gauging whether or not like a safe experience is better or worse than an online experience at that point. Yeah. It's a lot of uh, forced experiments. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. If I could hold all my classes outside, then, then that would be fantastic. Cause there's so little transmission in the outdoors that that's mm. one of the safest places to be. It's also going to be the thing that we're like, we all do this summer and then think it's all right. But outdoors is pretty safe. 
The only problem is in the fall, I live in New York. By uh, October, it might be snowing. I mean, it was snowing in May here. <laughs> so, uh, Melissa, this is a completely personal question for myself, my own interest. Can I resume playing pickleball outside? I think if it is an outdoor sport and you are not in front of people for more than a minute or so at a time, that it is safe. Okay. Me and my running buddies have all been running together, like, you know, together outdoors this whole time without any trouble. Okay. New York has even opened back up tennis and golf. Okay. Okay. That's, that's kind of exciting. All right. Um, now that we've answered my big questions. Um, so students who have never done any kind of online uh, learning environments, what kinds of things would you suggest uh, to them that, uh, that may be helpful, especially when they have ADHD? So you're going to get a couple different kinds of instructors in this, but one of the main kind are, here's the book, learn from it. And they're the ones who also would have done the version of, I'm going to talk to you about the book and you will learn from it this way. But now there's a lot less of that, or they'll provide you a video or a podcast version of them doing exactly the same thing, which if you think they're fun in person, I'm sure they're just as fun on video, which is to say that kind of thing is hard to follow. And it turns out that both of those actually, both listening and reading are like the worst ways our brain actually picks up information. So the, the problem is you can't rely on that. You've got to be aware that if you read a chapter in a book, your brain can't do all that information right away. So you really can't just read a chapter in a book. You have to have a plan that involves a way to get that information to move through your short-term memory, which in ADHD, we have enough trouble keeping that tracked. And then into your functional long-term memory, which again, in ADHD, we have it. It's there. But your, your long-term memory, I was explaining it, it's like a great big warehouse. It can hold a ton of stuff. But if you've ever gone looking for something in a warehouse, you know that unless you have a really good system of labeling, tracking, and following, it can be hard to find things. And inherently, that's part of the problem that we have. So we've got stuff in the warehouse and no way to attach to it. So you've got to find the ways to make all those connections. Are, are, you, a, uh, are you a Harry Potter fan? I am familiar enough. <laughs> so one of the analogies I sometimes think about when thinking about recall of long-term uh, information, it's sort of like the, the moving staircases that just sort of move at random, right? With no rhyme or reason, like the information's in there. Sometimes your brain will give you access to it and sometimes it won't. Right. That's exactly it. And so I always tell my students that you're not training to learn the information, the information finds its way there. The goal of learning is actually training yourself to bring the information back when you need it, to essentially get the staircases to move in the right direction when you want them to. And so all of my memory and learning techniques tend to come along with, well, how can I turn, I need this piece of information now to I make all the right connections so that piece of information is accessible to me now. All right, give us give, give some concrete tips on how students can do that. So when reading, I always say that you should read, assuming that you're going to take notes on everything. And then with listening too, and you can take notes in whatever way works for you. I type, other people write, and there's honestly just enough evidence on both sides. But some of the key with it is to make sure that your notes are in your words. That information has to go from the book to your brain before it goes back to the page. If it goes from the book to your eyes and you copy it exactly to the page, it never stopped in your brain mm. and doesn't get to the right place. So I, I strongly recommend reading a paragraph or two and then creating your own summary, making a note of what makes sense to you and finding things that you're like, oh, that's interesting and associating with it. But Dr. B, that sounds like it would take so long. Yeah, and it does. <laughs> but it, on the other hand, you could reread the same chapter five times in that space and learn nothing. I would also suggest also it, it would take longer to have to retake the same class because you were you failed it and because you didn't have the proper learning strategies. So 
Um, yeah, learning, especially with ADHD, uh, for, for content that maybe isn't something that like you get jazzed about, um, is, can be kind of cumbersome and laborious. Um, you know, one of the things that I found to be really interesting when I was, uh, when I was a college student, uh, especially in the, in the, those sort of, um, gen eds that you had sort of had to take that weren't necessarily directly connected to my major or my, or my interest was I'm like, all right, like I have to understand this stuff. And it's, and that was part of the, the way I approach it. Not just like, all right, I need to memorize this stuff. It's like, no, I need to understand it in order for me to be able to, you know, take tests or anything on it. I couldn't just like have a, a game of memorization and, and recall. It didn't work for me. So for me, I had to look at a concept that was presented a number of different ways in order for my brain to go, Oh, so this is sort of like that. And when, and when this book sort of explained it this way and that book explained it this way and that book explained it this other way, that all makes sense because of how this all, could, which is like, <laughs> I think back and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is why I was in the, the, like the library for the almost the entirety of my college career. Um, but it worked and I, it was kind of like I did what I needed to do. And that's kind of how I understood learning. That's great. The nice thing nowadays too, is that YouTube has done a lot of this work for you. And so there are so many people out there who have made interesting versions of stuff or back relate something to a new concept or give you a different metaphor to explain it. And if you just type it into YouTube, you'll find six or seven of them. So I was just thinking that I would just check what one of the strategies I would do it. I would like Google, um, uh, like different for different videos on certain topics. If I would like read something a couple of times and I'd be like, I still have no idea what I just read. Right. I'd be like, all right, how does somebody else explain this? And I would, then I was like struck. Oh my gosh, that was 20 years ago. I'm like, wait, was YouTube around 20 years ago? Cause I know that I remember looking for videos on concepts, um, 20 years ago when I was in college. Um, so looking for videos, taking notes that are not just, copying the notes, but really processing, putting it into your own words. What else? One of the things that I think is important to remember is that your brain wants it to be easy. So if you read through something and it does kind of make sense, your brain will also try to be like, oh, well, now you're done with that because I understood it. But if you step away from it and can't actually remember what you've read, you're also not going to be ready for the tests. So you got to practice the actual process of recall of walking away and saying, now, what was that I just went through? And even just doing that, reading through something, shutting your eyes and trying to remember a bunch of it, put your brain into three times as much gear as rereading it or God forbid, highlighting. I hate highlighting. I know it makes you feel really, really good, but it is the worst trick that education ever invented. But to say, say more about that. Why, why is that? Because it does exactly that. It puts something in front of you and you look at it and you say, oh, that's in color. I know that thing. But most of the time, when you look away from it, you don't know that thing. Flashcards, though, they are fantastic. They are. The amount of flashcards that I created for myself during college, I mean, it was gross. How many flash? I mean, boxes and boxes of flashcards. Because one of the things that, um, when I, I read the book, um, uh, make it stick the science of, of learning one of my favorite books it was so validating because like i had done all that stuff before like knowing like other science that supports all this stuff um because i knew that i needed to be able to fill in the gap between like information that's there and what's not there and just reading information in front of you is not studying no, it's not. And it's not very useful. But the real problem is that most of your instructors aren't going to have this already built in. Like I do. I have built my class around these concepts. You can't get away with not having this information. But a lot of your instructors are not. So you need to know that what you need to do is look at stuff, then try to remember it, then quiz yourself, then go explain it to everybody who you're currently living with. That's actually my favorite one is if you just go tell people about it, yep. you're again, engaging your brain in a way you just weren't expecting. Because then you also figure out, wait, what don't I actually know when you try to, <laughs> we try to explain it? You also said something about making it easy. Now, when I was, I remember doing comp, like complex stuff that was not necessarily stuff that I was interested in. There was a, 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 a term that I would put into a Google search. So let's say, um, I wanted to learn about aquatic microbiology. 
psychology and I'm just like, what the hell is this? I just read the same thing and I don't understand it. The term that I would add into that Google search is third grade. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I like the, uh, the Reddit, describe it like I'm five. And I, I actually Ooh. tell my students to do that. I'm like, okay, so you just read me your definition. How would you explain that to a five-year-old? Brilliant. If you I, can't explain science to a five-year-old, you don't understand it. It's so true. I think there's an Einstein quote that's something about that. Like, you know, it, it takes a really intelligent person to understand this concept, but it takes a genius to explain it to a kindergartner. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do a lot of that kind of stuff. And I'm sure part of it is because I had to do that to get it through my brain originally. I mean, I pick up this stuff pretty quick, but I like to know the bolts and the details. And so I'm good at explaining that kind of stuff, which is why I do the job I do. But also it helps if, you know, I ask them to do the same things. And so if you try to, to put that information into a simplistic form, your brain now has to process it, work with it and make it happen. And double bonus points, if you can add something cute, funny and stupid to it, because cute, funny and stupid things also stick in your brain. <laughs> And inappropriate and sexual. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. I tell my students all the time, the dirtier your mnemonic device is, the better you remember it. It's so true. It is so true. Um, I remember a while back when I had my clinical practice, I was helping a high school student like with, with some study strategies. And we came up with some of the raunchiest like mnemonics. And I just said, I'm like, you can't let your teachers know how you memorize this. Like you will get in so much trouble, but it's fantastic. Um, so yeah. Like you want to know the best ones, talk to nursing students because they have so many things they have to remember and their mnemonics are so dirty. Nice. <laughs> Okay, so we talked about note-taking strategies. We talked about a way to synthesize and sort of capture the, the essence of it by sort of getting it, you know, understanding it as a, a third grader. Um, what are some other challenges that college students may be facing um, in an environment that may be more online? So one of the, the biggest sort of ADHD challenges for that is sorting out your time management and prospective memory items in a situation where all of your triggers have been taken away. So it was easier to remember things when I had to be in a certain place at a certain time on a certain day, but just trying to remember when all my online items happen is much harder. I mean, it's hard enough for me and I set up all the dates. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can, I only imagine, and I send my students an email like every day, like this is due and then this is due, but most people will not. So you've got to set up your own sort of, here's my list of things that are due. Here's my reminders. Here are the items that are coming. And here's the stuff I got to hit. Is, is um, rate my professor still a thing? Yes. Okay. So I would encourage any like new student who is like yet to sign up for classes, go on to rate my professor and see what kind of teaching style your professor is. Is it someone who's, who is like Dr. B here, I'm guessing pretty engaging and entertaining, or is it going to be someone who talks kind of like this and maybe reads from the book with recordings and is not really responsive and I've already put you to sleep? Yeah, no, you, you definitely can get that information. And nowadays, like our school has an app. It's really funny because like the students have access to it, but so do we. Um, they'll ask each other about different professors. Since I'm social media nerd, I've taken to responding to the ones that ask about me. Nice. Usually with like silly things about telling bad jokes and playing good music. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, that was a that was a game saver for me in, in both undergrad and grad school because if I, I, I couldn't, I could not do bad teachers. Like... It, Cause I would, just, I would shut down like, and I would disengage and I needed the teachers who were like controversial and who were like known to sort of like be, like go against the grain. Uh, like those are the kind of professors that like light me up. Um, so I knew that I needed that for, for my, uh, learning. Now, uh, we're going to take another quick break, but when we come back, um, one of the things that I think is uh, that, that a lot of students may be facing and I think a lot of, of us, uh, who are not students may be facing is that as we are sort of coming out of um, these, this uh, social distancing and, and uh, quarantining that we may be going, because a lot of the stuff that I've heard um, from what I follow kind of in and out of 
this social distancing um, and quarantine um, kind of back and forth. And so how can students sort of prepare and, and get ready for a potential need to shift their whole routine back and forth in potentially a very short period of time. So when we come back from our break, we will dive into that. We will be right back. This podcast is brought to you by our patrons over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. If you would like to become a patron of ADHD Rewired, we welcome you and we appreciate you. When you go to our website at ADHDrewired.com, click the Patreon link at the top right and select a tier that is right for you. As this podcast is free to listeners, it's not free to produce. I appreciate everyone who could financially support this podcast. And I want to welcome Janet C. at the $10 a month level and Terry at the $5 a month level. Thank you so much. Consider giving at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I appreciate everyone's support. If you are able to support this podcast, I sincerely thank you. For those of you that have been giving at the $25 a month level, our next group coaching call is today, Tuesday, July 28th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Our group coaching calls are every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And as always, if you can't support this podcast financially, consider leaving a review on your favorite podcast player. All support is appreciated. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. Check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curve this week and every Monday. This week, Will will focus on physical energy management. If this is your first time listening, check out this short podcast that covers so many topics from getting off the hamster wheel to fighting resistance. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things that you want to do. Subscribe to these short, mindful ways to hack your ADHD. Go to hackingyouradhd.com for show notes and to subscribe. And every Friday, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. At ADHD Essentials, they help families develop the skills and knowledge needed to better manage ADHD. Go to ADHDessentials.com to learn more. Both Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials are both part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. Have you been wanting to join one of our live Q&As? Then mark your calendar right now and set a notification to register for this event, which is free. Join the host of Hacking Your ADHD, Will Curb, and the host of ADHD Essentials, Brendan Mahan, for an hour of live Q&A, August 11th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register for this and upcoming live Q&As. Join us every second Tuesday day of the month at 10 30 a.m pacific 1 30 p.m eastern for an hour of live q a register for free at adhdrewired.com slash events that's adhdrewired.com slash events mark your calendar for our next live q a august 11th at 1 30 p.m eastern we'll see you there all right we are back with dr b and um when maybe we're in the fall now and we're in our groove and classes are back in session and things are starting to feel maybe a little bit more familiar. And because of that, the cases of COVID-19 skyrocket again. And now we have to go back to, uh, um, you know, sheltering in place and um, uh, life gets shut down again for a while. Any suggestions on both how to respond to that, but then also how to prepare for the potential of that. Yeah, that is 100% one of our planned scenarios is that like we're allowed to go back and then we anticipate it shifting. So <laughs> there is very real possibilities of of that kind of thing happening. So I find and for me and for other people that one of the 
keys has been maintaining aspects of my schedule that I can. So when we shift back into, now I don't have to get up again. No, no, give yourself an impetus to get up and be on a schedule. So creating your own schedule, especially when you're ADHD and you don't have one is, is key. And I'm sure I've heard you talk about that kind of thing before, but maintaining that. When I teach online in general, I tell my online students what my expectations are. It's like, here's how many hours a week you would be expected to work on this class. How can you fit those hours into your schedule? How can you make it work? And then another thing is being aware that that you're going to have to do all that work in sort of the one spot non-shifting thing and make that kind of situation work for you, not being able to to get the novelty of moving from one place to another, of doing something a little bit different. Also, in this case for the fall, I know we had this problem big time since we were not expecting it. Um, Make copies of everything or make everything accessible in multiple ways. (laughs) So, for instance, I have, I, I am a Google Docs, Google everything person because at some point I learned that it's in the cloud. And so it doesn't matter which device I forgot, which is any given one on any given day, um, my stuff is somewhere in Google. And if I can get on a browser, it is there. One time our whole school network went down for three days and I was the only one who could work because all of my stuff was in the cloud. It was amazing. But all my student stuff is in the cloud too. So I can just be like, hey guys, here's everything. You have access to it at home. Put all your notes in the cloud somewhere. Mm. Now, I know that every sort of institution is different, um, but it sounds like part of what you're saying is that, so if you have a... a, um, sort of learning environment where it's traditional learning, you're going to a classroom and then it switches. It sounds like there's not necessarily like the online, like Zoom meetings, um, which is kind of surprised. Is that kind of what you're saying that that when they, they go online, they're not necessarily having online meetings? Depends on what you're, what different institutions have been doing it differently. We definitely had a lot of conversations about that as faculty, like across the country. My institution is a community college. So the moment things shifted and so we were online and so all the world changed, my students have children at home. So I can no longer guarantee their class Uh. times because they can no longer guarantee their daytimes. And a lot of mine worked Mm. in the services that suddenly were picking up in some way. Their grocery store shifts changed a significant amount. Their fast food shifts changed a significant amount. Community college students could not be counted on to show up at nine o'clock in the morning anymore. I don't know why that, that had like never even dawned on me as like. So- yeah, it's a different population. People think of college as 18 to 20 year olds who just aren't doing anything else right. with their lives. But <laughs> even they're not, even that's not true anymore. Most of them have jobs and the jobs all changed hours when everything shut down in some manner, or they needed to pick up different jobs because they needed more hours in some fashion. And so many of them have kids. I don't even try to figure out who's a parent anymore. They're all parents. I just go with it. So what would you suggest then if someone is like, should I go back to school this fall? And and if they were planning on going to, to community college, especially, um, what would you suggest? I mean, cause that just sounds like terrifying. <laughs> Honestly, community college is probably the best place people can be. Mm. We are already built for teaching and learning as our main goal. So we're not trying to do a bunch of other stuff. We're already used to students who have kind of haphazard schedules and worlds that are a little bit different. And honestly, our proportion of people with ADHD is really high, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. And it's pretty easy to tell. And so we're, we're a good place to go. So like, instead of spending a lot of money on whatever school you were going to, your local community college might actually be a good side place or a place where you could take a few classes while you're trying to go forward. Because there's not going to be much else happening. If everything shuts down again, you're not going to have anything else to do. You might as well learn something. So you you said that that your uh, community college is sort of um, making preparations for the potential of needing to be on the either call it a schedule and B schedule, right? Like a schedule is like the people are in the classroom. B schedule is people are at home, right? Like what can, like, what are the reasonable 
things that people can do to sort of, um, cause we know that transitions, especially those that we didn't anticipate can be really hard for us. Right. So what are some reasonable, uh, um, steps that students might be able to take to prepare for the potential inevitability of needing to go back to um, a more a shelter in place uh, scenario? I would say sort of universal learning design concepts, which are something we're trying to incorporate more into our classes, are multi-modes always works better. So don't start a semester assuming you're going to be able to learn everything from a lecture. Start it with the idea that you should also learn from a book and you should also have a secondary plan. You should also have, so even if you're pretty good at catching stuff from a lecture, if you're already working on the book ahead of time, already looking ahead at the assignments and seeing which ones may or may not be troublesome. And most importantly, and this is this is just college-wide pandemic or not, stay in touch with your instructors. Because, I mean, we're people too. We're also going to be overwhelmed by everything. But also, the vast majority of us care a lot about our students. And even though we get really, really frustrated, I am, if a student is like in touch with me and says, I want to do this and I'm having trouble, we're much more likely to be like, we'll find a way. We'll make it work. We'll do something to make it happen. And so especially make those connections with your instructors if you're on campus at the beginning as early as possible so that if things change, you've got that connection. It's already there. You can already do it. So I, mean, I, I always suggest that, that students don't wait until they're having problems to talk to their professors, to, to introduce themselves immediately. Um, and so maybe part of that initial conversation can include like, I'm feeling nervous about if we need to go to this, uh, going back to a shelter in place, kind of uh, like how I'm going to respond to that. So I wanted to maybe let you know that ahead of time that, this may be a struggle for me and I may be reaching out if the scenario um, comes up, right? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. I want to know, I tell my students all the time, I want to know what your issues are and what's happening with you and things like that. Cause if I know, and you talk to me, I can work around it. And if I find out three weeks later, there's not as much I can do. Okay. Now I have a, a couple, um, well, before I have a couple of questions that are completely not related to this, but before we do that, are there any kind of like, Final tips you would want to that you want to uh, suggest to uh, to uh, students during these uncertain times. Yeah, remember that learning really is hard and uncomfortable, and it's going to feel that way no matter what. And I promise, when it feels that way, it's working. <laughs> and ask all the questions. Don't be afraid to. Even when I get stupid questions and I say, "Wow, that was a stupid question," I answer it because somebody needs that answer. So <laughs> don't worry about how it feels or even if they're going to think that, you know, ask the question. You can't tell if it's your fault or not until you find out. Because you're paying to ask that question. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. So here's my question for you. Um, you love science fiction. What's your favorite science fiction book? I'm an Isaac Asimov fan. And so I, I actually have read like all of his robot novels and all the way through the Foundation series uh, back when, and I love it. Um, but interestingly enough, I think my favorite is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is then a satire on Foundation. And it's better if you've read Foundation. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay. And um, when you do have the chance to uh, rock out a karaoke, what is your go-to karaoke song? I am an 80s classic rock go-to, so I, I will either hit up Journey, all of Journey, whatever they've done, or, or Bon Jovi. Awesome. I like Dead or Alive. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Melissa Barlett. Yeah, I got that right. Yeah, okay. Got that um, right. As I'm like asking you that, I'm like questioning, like, did I, did I do it? Okay. Um, I'm so challenged with names. Um, and that's all right. You also do some videos um, that you have on YouTube. You wanted to share the link for that and uh, let people know how they can reach you if they are so inclined to do so. Absolutely. I am uh, Doc Barlett, D-O-C-B-A-R-L-E-T-T, -T, pretty much everywhere that I am accessible. So I'm at Doc Barlett on Twitter. Uh, my YouTube is, if you youtube.com backslash Doc Barlett will take you to my YouTube channel. Um, I think there might be a couple other places that you would find me that way, but 
probably, I'm pretty much on Twitter and uploading things to YouTube somewhat regularly at this point since I'm doing so much academic stuff. And now I'm docbarlet at gmail.com. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your, your time and wisdom with us. And um, I wish you the best when you go back to school in the fall. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. 
self-care is not selfish. And no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.